Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Public Health Ontario Rounds presentation on Backyard Chickens, a cross-sectional survey of current and prospective backyard chicken owners. My name is Curtis Russell, and I am EZ VBD Senior Program Specialist at Public Health Ontario, and I have the pleasure of moderating today's session. Before we begin, I would like to do a land acknowledgement. We are fortunate to have people attending from across Ontario, but this PHO Rounds is hosted virtually from Toronto, and we acknowledge that the land we are hosting this virtual educational session on is a traditional terry of many territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. I will now mention a few housekeeping items. The chat pod has been disabled to limit any distractions during the presentation. Please use the Q&A pod if you have questions during the session. A discussion and question period will follow the presentation. If at any point during this presentation you experience any technical issues, please email capacitybuilding at oahpp.ca. I would like to state as a moderator of this session, I have no conflicts of interest. It is now my pleasure to introduce the speakers of today's presentation, Dr. Catherine Pafidis and Dr. Kevin Met Dr. Devin Metcalf. Dr. C Catherine Pafidis is an enteric zoonotic specialist at Public Health Ontario and is the co-chair of the IPAC Canada Surveillance and Applied Epidemiology Interest Group. Her research focuses on the surveillance and epidemiology of enteric and zoonotic pathogens in Ontario, including salmonella. Dr. Devin Metcalf is an IPAC specialist of Public Health Ontario and is associate editor of the Canadian Journal of Infection Control. Her research focuses on the impact of zoonotic infections on IPAC practices and healthcare settings. Catherine, over to you. Thank you, Curtis. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today on what I'm told is both World Zoonoses Day and National Fried Chicken Day, which seems appropriate to our subject matter for today. So today, Devin and I are excited to share with you an overview of a recent survey of Ontario backyard chicken owners that we did in collaboration with Dr. Scott Weiss and the Center for Public Health and Zoonoses, specifically looking at why people have or want backyard chickens and what attitudes or behaviors may increase their risk of acquiring a zoonotic pathogen from their chickens. Before we start, just a note that neither Devin or I has a conflict of interest to declare. To give you a quick overview of what we will be covering in today's session, we will briefly discuss some of the main zoonotic diseases that are transmissible from backyard chickens to people. Next, we will provide some context on why we were interested in this topic by giving an overview of reported cases and of outbreaks linked to contact with backyard chickens. And finally, we will dive into what we looked at in our survey, what we found and where we think we can go next with this work. So by the end of this session, it is our hope that you will be able to list some of the pathogens that are transmissible from backyard chickens to people, describe some of the interactions that people may have with their chickens that may increase their risk of exposure, identify some of the misconceptions that backyard chicken owners may have regarding zoonotic pathogens transmissible by their chickens, and finally to consider how this information may be of use to public health organizations. So to start with some background information, Chickens may be carrying pathogenic bacteria in their gastrointestinal tract, and they may shed the bacteria into the surrounding environment via their feces without displaying any outward clinical signs of illness. So it's quite common and normal for these bacteria to be there. People, however, may become ill with these organisms if they do not take appropriate preventative measures, such as performing hand hygiene after handling their chickens, their eggs, or bedding, or if they don't wash eggs with visible fecal contamination prior to consuming these. And anecdotally, we hear often of people doing things like bringing their chickens inside their homes to sit on their knee, maybe while they drink their morning coffee, or to cuddle with their kids. Although most illnesses are self-limiting, some people, and particularly children under the age of five, adults over the age of 65, and those with compromised immune systems, may be at risk of more serious complications if they do become ill. However, having an awareness of potential disease risks and how to prevent these can help to reduce the risk of infection. So in recent years, backyard chickens have been, coming, have been increasing in popularity in Ontario and elsewhere, and particularly in urban and suburban areas where many municipalities have either amended or enacted local bylaws to make it easier for people to keep backyard chickens. 
So people interested in having backyard chickens may acquire these with the intention of keeping them year round or long term. And for those that want a shorter term or trial commitment, there are also options to rent these for one or more seasons. And a search of available information online found that while companies offering backyard chickens for sale or rental typically do provide interested persons with information on animal husbandry and some of the benefits of raising backyard chickens, there does appear to be much less information, if any, provided regarding zoonotic disease risks and how to minimize or prevent these. So as I mentioned earlier, um, chickens commonly carry bacteria in their gastrointestinal tract, and they may shed this bacteria into the environment via their feces. Two of these, Salmonella and Campylobacter, are also common causes of human enteric illness. So to give a quick overview of each of these pathogens, Salmonella infection is typically acquired through ingestion of contaminated food or water, through direct or indirect animal contact, or less commonly from an infected person, so through person-to-person -person transmission. Following exposure, most infected persons typically develop signs and symptoms of salmonella infection within about three days, although for some serotypes, the incubation period may be a bit longer and up to about seven to 10 days. And although there are over 2,500 different serotypes of the bacterium, only about 100 of these typically cause most human infection. And in Ontario, the most commonly reported serotypes each year are Salmonella enteritidis, Salmonella typhimurium, Newport, Infantis, and Heidelberg, each of which is associated to varying degrees with poultry. And people can prevent illness associated with Salmonella by doing things like thoroughly cooking meat and eggs to a safe internal temperature prior to consumption, preferably using a probe thermometer to check the internal temperature, and through washing their hands after handling raw meat or after having contact with animals, their bedding, or food, for example. So similarly, Campylobacteria, Campylobacter bacteria are also primarily transmitted through ingestion of contaminated food or water, including undercooked meat, unpasteurized milk, or through contact with animals. Unlike Salmonella, however, Campylobacter infection is usually self-limiting and is less likely to be spread person to person. Symptoms are similar to those caused by Salmonella, but may take several days longer to appear following exposure, although most people typically show signs and symptoms of infection within about two to five days. Similar to the preventative measures for Salmonella, people can also prevent illness associated with Campylobacter by avoiding consumption of unpasteurized milk or unpasteurized milk products, thoroughly cooking meat and eggs prior to consumption, again using a probe thermometer to verify internal temperatures, washing their hands after handling raw meat or after having contact with animals, their bedding, or food. So very similar in terms of prevention. So you may be thinking, okay, that makes sense in theory, but how big of an issue is this in practice? Well, PulseNet US is the national lab network for enteric disease surveillance in the United States. In 2021, Nichols et al. published a summary of salmonella outbreaks linked to backyard poultry in the US in 2020 during the COVID-19 pandemic, which conveniently overlapped with the period when our survey was open for responses, which Devin will tell you about shortly. And according to the authors, numerous outbreaks of salmonella were identified by PulseNet in 2020, where cases were related to one another at a molecular level by whole genome sequencing. And altogether, a total of 1,722 cases were identified and linked to one of 17 outbreaks associated with 12 different salmonella serotypes, which I've listed on the slide here. This was a huge increase over the previous year, where there were just over 1,100 cases across a combined 13 salmonella outbreaks. Of those cases that were identified in the US in 2020, just under a quarter of the cases were children under the age of five, and of 1,000 people with information available, a third were hospitalized. When they investigated further, there was a strong link with exposure to backyard poultry. So when I say poultry in this instance, I mean both chickens and ducks and other poultry. And of those cases with exposure information available, two thirds of these reported that they'd had contacts with chicks or ducklings in the week before their illness. And when investigators collected samples from backyard poultry and from their environment, they were actually able to confirm that the isolates were a near perfect whole genome sequencing match to three of the salmonella serotypes associated with human illness. So they also noted that while there were no changes to the salmonella outbreak detection or reporting processes that could explain the increase in cases, there was, however, an increase in backyard poultry sales during the COVID-19 pandemic. And many cases who reported backyard poultry contact during their incubation period also reported that they had recently purchased poultry for the first time. So this was a relatively new acquisition and exposure for them. The CDC's conclusions from this outbreak were apparently that new poultry owners should be provided with education to prevent salmonella, and to do this they routinely work with both hatcheries and with stores that sell poultry. So fast forward to 2022, the CDC maintains a really handy web page that provides information on both current and historical salmonella outbreaks. 
excuse me, linked to backyard poultry, including those that were summarized by Nichols et al. I've copied a snapshot of the page summarizing those from 2022 on the slide here. So as you can see, in 2022, the CDC reported that they'd identified over 1,200 people infected with one of several strains of salmonella linked to one of 13 multi-state outbreaks associated with backyard poultry. Again, the implicated serotypes were similar to those in the previous year, and these included salmonella enteritidis and typhimurium, both of which are among the most commonly reported serotypes in North America each year, including in Canada, as well as Salmonella 4512i, which is a monophasic variant of Salmonella typhimurium, and Salmonella's Hadar, Indiana, Infantis, and Ambandica. The cases ranged in age from 1 to 102, with a median age of 36 years, and just over a fifth were children under the age of 5. Following case interviews, a link was reported again with backyard poultry, as many cases reported having contact with backyard poultry before becoming ill. Interestingly, about a third reported that they had eaten eggs from backyard poultry, and 3% reported that they'd eaten meat from their backyard poultry before getting sick. As of June 15th this year, in 2023, the CDC is currently reporting just over 400 cases of salmonella linked to backyard poultry exposure, and again with similar serotypes associated with illness to those seen in previous years. So as you can see, this is an ongoing issue in the US with numerous cases of reported salmonellosis linked to backyard chickens each year. So that's in the US. What about Canada? And specifically, what about Ontario? Public Health Ontario reports trends for those pathogens on which we conduct routine surveillance in Ontario, including both Campylobacter and Salmonella. And for 2021, the most recent year for which these data are publicly available on our website, the total number of human cases, hospitalizations, and deaths are shown here. So for context, Campylobacter is consistently the bacterial enteric pathogen most frequently identified in people in Ontario, followed by Salmonella with exposures responsible for illness including contaminated food, travel-related exposures, or direct or indirect animal contact, including with backyard poultry. We also know that the true burden of illness in the community, associated with each of these pathogens, is likely far higher, as for every case that we know about who develops symptoms, seeks medical attention, and pursues confirmatory testing, and is then interviewed by the local public health unit to identify potentially causative exposures, there are at least several other cases that do not go through this process and are not ultimately identified through our surveillance system. So similar to the increase in backyard poultry ownership that was observed in the United States during the COVID-19 pandemic, Public Health Ontario also identified through data collected from case interviews by local health units during the pandemic, that there was also an increase in individuals reporting contact with backyard poultry when asked about contact with animals during the incubation period. So contact with backyard poultry was subsequently added to the standardized questionnaires for both Salmonella and Campylobacter infections as an individual risk factor to enable illnesses linked to backyard poultry to be more easily identified and differentiated from other animal contact. So looking back at the exposure information for all reported cases of Salmonella and Campylobacter in people in 2022, 16% of our Campylobacter cases and almost 3.5%, so a little less, of our Salmonella cases reported having contact with backyard chickens in the week or so prior to symptom onset. Interestingly, the implicated serotypes, which I've listed on the slide here, among those cases who reported contact with backyard chickens were similar to those identified in the United States outbreaks linked to backyard chicken exposure. So although backyard chicken contact wasn't necessarily the exposure responsible for illness in these cases, the frequency with which contact with backyard chickens was reported and the same common serotypes being implicated may reflect their increased prevalence in Ontario and may reflect this as an emerging risk factor. An evidence review conducted by Public Health Ontario in 2017 found that while many individuals may keep backyard chickens and other poultry, their overall awareness of the risks of infectious diseases and of pathogen transmission associated with poultry contact may actually be limited, resulting in a failure to take appropriate preventative measures and potentially contributing to an increased risk of illness. So we've talked about zoonotic bacteria associated with backyard chickens. Wild birds are also a natural reservoir for most subtypes of influenza A viruses, and particularly waterfowl such as geese and ducks. Although they may be asymptomatic or experience mild illness, they are able to carry and transmit infection to other birds, including backyard chickens. Avian influenza viruses can be categorized into two groups, highly pathogenic and low pathogenic, based on the severity of illness they cause in infected poultry. Highly pathogenic avian influenza, or HPAI, can cause severe illness and death in infected birds. Influenza A, H5N1, has also been detected in mammals such as rodents, pigs, cats, and dogs. Backyard chickens may be exposed to highly pathogenic avian influenza if they come into direct or indirect contact with infected wild birds. Once birds are infected, there is unfortunately no treatment for the virus. 
Birds can also transmit influenza A, H5N1 to people if people have prolonged close contact with infected birds or their environment, although this risk is considered to be quite low. To minimize the risk of infection in backyard flocks, backyard chickens and other poultry should ideally be kept away from wild birds and close attention should be paid to biosecurity practices. For backyard chicken owners, this includes limiting contact between backyard poultry and visitors, preventing backyard chickens from having contact with animals, including other domestic pets, monitoring the chickens for signs of illness, and keeping their coops, waters, feeds, and any clothing and footwear used to enter the coop clean. So if you haven't seen it before, the CFIA maintains a really neat interactive dashboard for highly pathogenic avian influenza. And you can filter this by date, province, species, and the status of the animal at the time of sampling. So dead versus alive, for example. There's also a map that I've snapshotted here. And according to the legend available on this page, the blue stars correspond to farms where poultry have tested positive for HPAI or highly pathogenic avian influenza. And the green stars correspond to non-poultry positives. Red circles represent confirmed cases in wildlife, and yellow cases represent suspect cases. As you can see, there's a fair amount of overlap in those locations where detections have occurred in wildlife and in farms where poultry have tested positive, highlighting the importance of biosecurity practices, including by backyard flock owners. So I'm now going to hand things off to Devon, who's going to tell you more about our particular survey and our findings. So over to you, Devon. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so now I will talk about the study. So we published this earlier this year in the Canadian Veterinary Journal. This is involving a cross-sectional survey asking recent current and prospective backyard chicken owners about their interest in interactions with backyard chickens. We worked with Dr. Scott Weiss, who is a professor at the University of Guelph and the director of the Center for Public Health and Zoonoses and our very supportive co-collaborator. So we created an online survey using the platform Qualtrics and after receiving ethics approval from both the University of Guelph and Public Health Ontario, this was launched online in December 2019. It was a group effort to promote this survey. We had the support of some local public health units, the University of Guelph Centre for Public Health and Zoonoses, the Ontario Animal Health Network and SciFi, the Canadian Institute of Public Health Inspectors, who all promoted the survey through their web and social media pages. Responses were collected up until March 2021. Uh, this period had been extended a bit due to disruptions related to the COVID-19 pandemic and to give our partner agencies time to disseminate the survey. We were specifically interested in respondents from Ontario, and we wanted to know whether people have or want backyard chickens, why they want them, the types of interactions they typically have with their chickens, and overall what their awareness level was regarding zoonotic pathogen transmission. In addition, we asked about their preferences, about the sources and types of information they would want related to having and caring for their chickens. So our overall objectives were to assess interest in owning backyard chickens and identify the prevailing knowledge, attitude, and practice gaps related to zoonotic infection risk associated with these chickens. Ultimately, we wanted to identify gaps if there were any and then consider how to use this information to determine what resources could be created to inform backyard chicken owners about infection prevention related measures for handling and caring for their chickens. So jumping right in, we received 279 responses from Ontario. The vast majority were female at 81.5% and the most common age group of survey participants was in the 30 to 39 year age category with a third of the participants being of this age. We found it interesting that over a third, 36.5% uh, reporting having household members who were potentially high risk for infections. So this included young children under the age of five, elderly adults over the age of 65, people with compromised immune systems or who are pregnant. So this added to our interest about our uh, interactions people had with chickens, given the potential high risk to household members. So what was the interest in backyard chicken ownership? So most survey participants reported having current or recent backyard chickens. Nearly all had chickens year round and only 9% had them seasonally. So this would typically just be in the spring and summer months, possibly into the early fall. Apparently some breeds of chickens do quite well in Ontario winters, but there are some winterizing conditions for backyard coops. And those who didn't currently or recently have chickens, many reporting that they plan to get these in the near future. So overall, there was a lot of experience and interest in backyard chickens amongst the survey participants. So the majority of the survey participants reported getting their chickens from farms, feed stores, or their friends. And a few of the participants reported getting their chickens from a rental company. 
So Catherine and I uh, were looking into what is available in Ontario with respect to poultry rentals, and we found a number of companies that will provide all of the equipment needed. So the coops, often with an indoor and outdoor section, a water, a feeder, some feed and bedding, and usually a couple of egg laying hens. So there are a lot of options in Ontario for renting or owning backyard chickens. The rental option addresses the issue of individuals who don't want a long commitment or are perhaps concerned about caring for their chickens throughout the winter. So having these seasonal rentals allows people to have chickens during the spring and fall seasons. And looking at the additional information provided, there is usually information about caring for the animals, keeping them sufficiently warm and low temperatures and protected from predators. But it doesn't appear as though a lot is provided in the way of infection prevention strategies or zoonotic infection risks. So these seasonal coops may be rented to high risk settings such as long term care homes. There are a lot of online articles marketing chickens and coop rentals specifically to long term care homes as a type of therapy for residents, promoting them as strategies to increase daily activity for residents and as a way to decrease loneliness and increase socialization. But again, there isn't as much of an emphasis on risks or practices to reduce these risks, so there are likely some opportunities to reinforce some effective infection prevention strategies. Okay, in our survey responses, by far the most popular reason for having or wanting backyard chickens are for their fresh eggs. Additionally, a lot wanted them as a hobby or as a pet. Pest control was common as well because chickens will eat ticks and other insects that wander into your yard. But what stood out to us was the proportion of people who planned to eat their chickens. So just over 8% wanted chickens for their meat, which we found a bit surprising and hadn't considered that this might be a reason for getting chickens. So we hadn't actually included this in our list of pre-written response options. However, multiple survey participants indicated wanting chickens for meat under an open-ended other option. This is particularly interesting considering that the CDC, during their recent outbreak in investigations involving poultry that Catherine discussed, have noted around 3 or 4% of cases reported eating meat from backyard chickens before becoming ill. So this may be a more common practice than we realized. So in addition to the reasons for wanting backyard chickens identified in our survey and looking a bit more closely at the perceived benefits of owning chickens, during the pandemic there were reports of increases to backyard chicken rental and ownership. The article shown on this slide here mentions that anecdotally it was driven in part by egg shortages encountered in grocery stores and interest in establishing more food source sustainability. Additionally, there is interest in having chickens as a way to counter rising food costs, as a way to prevent food waste as chickens can eat food scraps, and a perceived increase in nutritional value or food safety specifically related to having control over what the chickens ate and were exposed to. So looking at the interactions with chickens, most survey respondents, once they have chickens, do consider them to be family pets. Although luckily when we dug a bit further, those who were likely to eat them did not consider them to be family pets. Many respondents allowed the chickens into their homes and respondents were significantly more likely to allow them into their homes if they considered them to be pets, which makes sense as pets are often considered members of the family and may have a lot of close interactions with their owners. A majority allowed chickens to interact with children or other pets and about 17% reported that they didn't always wash their hands after interacting with their chickens. So that's an opportunity for some education around the risks associated with interacting with the chickens and some mitigation measures that can be easily implemented to reduce the risk. When asked if chickens may leave the owner's property, many current or recent backyard chicken owners reported that chickens do leave the property from time to time. Around 40% reported chickens leave for one or more reasons. The most common reasons were to visit a veterinarian, which is good. They may participate in poultry shows or fairs. About a quarter do occasionally escape their owner's property. Anecdotally, I can say this is true. In the city where I live, I've definitely witnessed chickens wandering around unsupervised in people's front yards. And my very small dog never knows what to do when he sees a chicken during a walk. Uh, some leave the owner's properties for exercise or enrichment. And just over 9% of the chickens are permitted by their owners to roam freely. So all possibly allowing zoonotic pathogens to be tracked off site. Although consumption and handling of raw or undercooked poultry and eggs are the primary route of disease transmission, it would be prudent to consider these other potential pathways of exposure. And of interest, just over 15% might leave for the purpose of visiting settings such as schools or long-term care homes, which may present opportunities for the chickens to have contact with individuals who are high risk for zoonotic infections. 
Okay, back to the folks eating their backyard chickens. I'm told this photo of a chicken is appetizing, but as a vegetarian, I can't quite relate. As I mentioned, there was a significant difference in the number of those considering chickens to be pets and wanting them for their meat. But considering this a bit further, if backyard chicken owners are slaughtering their chickens themselves, and this is done by people without experience in slaughter, it can raise animal welfare and humane handling concerns. And similarly, if the chickens are ill or colonized with a zoonotic pathogen at the time of slaughter, then this may pose additional opportunities for zoonotic disease transmission. So now to talk a bit about risk perception. So when asked about awareness of the risk of specific pathogens, the results were mixed with some good knowledge about some and gaps in knowledge about others. So this graph is showing responses given when asked which of these can be passed from chickens to people. So we've just highlighted some of the responses with colors. The green bars we felt were answered fairly well with the majority answering correctly. So most current previous or prospective backyard chicken owners correctly indicated that bacterial pathogens such as salmonella and E. coli could be transmitted from chickens to people, which is good. However, looking at the yellow bars, far fewer respondents correctly reported that avian influenza or Campylobacter species could be transmitted from backyard chickens to people. So given the current avian influenza situation in Ontario and more broadly, the failure to recognize the possible risk here is a concern. And as mentioned previously, Campylobacter enteritis cases in Ontario actually outnumber salmonellosis cases. And several respondents indicated that mites and ticks were a concern and were transmissible from chickens to people. Although they can infest chickens and could potentially bite a human, they aren't generally considered to be a human parasite. There are fleas that are common to chickens where people can also be hosts, such as the stick tight flea, but aren't generally a common concern and usually only called a mild irritation in humans in the areas where they attach. And interestingly, just over 7% reported that rabies could be transmitted from backyard chickens to people, but rabies is generally not considered a significant risk from chickens. And just to highlight some additional findings that we thought were interesting, most respondents reported that they did look up information on backyard chickens, so there is an appetite for information, so this was around 85% of the respondents. While almost 80% wanted information on how to prevent diseases in chickens, just under 60% wanted information on how to prevent disease transmissions from chickens to people. So possibly owners are more concerned about the health of their chickens than risk to themselves, potentially reflecting a gap in awareness of the risk. And they prefer to obtain information online and less than half of the backyard chicken flocks had ever visited a veterinarian. So they were more likely to visit a veterinarian to diagnose and treat an illness, but less likely to seek care for regular checkups or vaccinations. So just to provide a quick summary and highlight some of the conclusions from the survey and key takeaways, there does appear to be some misconceptions around what pathogens people can acquire from their chickens and when combined with the perceptions of chickens as pets and some reported interactions that can potentially increase the risk, we clearly have some opportunities for pathogen transmission and with the right messaging, some opportunities for prevention. Consumption of backyard chickens was a bit of a surprise finding, and that would be associated with other potential issues, such as biosafety and animal welfare concerns, as previously mentioned. There are infection prevention and control and biosecurity practices that could be implemented to reduce the risk of transmission of infection to the owners and opportunities to consult with local animal health care providers, such as veterinarians, that could improve education in both the provision of education directly to owners or through the dissemination of educational resources. So I think this survey highlighted that there are a lot of great opportunities to have an impact. So considering what the implications may be more broadly to public health, there are knowledge gaps with respect to safe practices that may result in backyard chicken owners being at an increased risk of infections. It would be worthwhile to consider strategies to fill these gaps. Backyard chicken owners may benefit from educational resources to increase their awareness of risk and awareness of appropriate infection prevention practices they can implement to protect themselves, their families, and their chickens. One challenge is a lack of information available on individual flocks within communities, as not all municipalities require individuals to report or register flocks of backyard chickens. So reaching out to the backyard chicken owners to provide information or offer educational resources would be difficult. Potentially having some information available at the points of purchase or renting chickens or through veterinarians or through the municipalities that do require registering might help disseminate important information related to reducing the risk of these infections. 
and recognizing that contact with backyard chickens could be a significant exposure risk when investigating cases of salmonella or campylobacter infections is important. So for anyone who currently has or is interested in having backyard poultry, there are some basic infection prevention practices that can reduce the risk of zoonotic infectious agents. The first, most important, and arguably the easiest, is hand hygiene. As a really important practice, in general, washing your hands before and after contact with poultry or their environment will always be a good idea. If your hands are visibly soiled, use soap and water, and if not, alcohol-based hand rub is fine. Avoid direct contact between backyard poultry and high-risk household members if possible. So anyone who's immunocompromised, very young or of an advanced age, if there is contact between poultry and any high-risk individuals, this is where practices such as hand hygiene should be emphasized. And for everyone, so not just immunocompromised individuals, but everyone uh, should avoid specific high-risk types of contact, such as kissing and cuddling chickens and eating or drinking near them, all increasing the risk of illness and so should be avoided. And supervising children during animal contact, ensuring that they do clean their hands after contact, but also preventing those risky activities that they might be inclined to do, such as kissing the chickens. And avoid bringing backyard poultry into your home, especially into areas where food is stored and prepared, such as the kitchen. Bringing poultry indoors has the risk of contaminating your home environment. And keeping backyard poultry and their feed and water away from wild birds. So preventing anything that would attract wild animals in general is a good idea. Backyard poultry that have tested positive for highly pathogenic avian influenza were thought to potentially have had contact with wild infected birds. And related to this, just generally keeping closures, food and water containers clean, being aware of the clothing worn during activities such as cleaning out the coops, uh, changing clothes or having dedicated clothes and footwear for those activities can further reduce the risk. And seek veterinary care if poultry show clinical signs of illness. So from an animal welfare standpoint, it's important to care for your animals, but it's also important to identify what is causing your birds to be sick. And finally, practice safe food handling, including cooking eggs and meat to safe internal temperatures. And here we just wanted to highlight uh, some resources that provide additional information on backyard chickens and associated considerations. So Public Health Ontario has a great evidence brief looking at reducing the risks associated with backyard chickens. Currently a 2017 version is available on our website, but this is being updated soon. We also have a new resource, an at a glance, highly pathogenic avian influenza infection prevention and control guidance for veterinary clinics. So this looks at some basic infection prevention and control practices from veterinary staff when they are providing care for companion animals with clinical signs consistent with highly pathogenic avian influenza or high risk exposures. Additionally, the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs has some great resources for small flock poultry owners. The first is a document on biosecurity recommendations for small flock owners with practices focused on preventing contact with wild birds, rodent control, avoiding mixing birds of different species, and recognizing and addressing any illnesses in the birds. And a second resource from OMAFRA addressing similar issues. And one from the Canadian Food Inspection Agency focused on preventing disease in small flocks and pet birds. So just to touch on future work, uh, since we did a identify some gaps in knowledge, it would be great to perhaps work with others to develop some educational resources to address this gap, promote measures that could mitigate the risk of transmission of infection. It'd be great to work or support public health units, suppliers of the chickens, or even veterinarians in ensuring they're able to share appropriate necessary information to individuals who have chickens. And as mentioned, PHO did recently develop that resource for veterinarians specifically about infection prevention practices to mitigate the risk of avian influenza as this is for when they are providing care for companion animals with clinical signs consistent of an infection, there may be opportunities to look more broadly at developing resources for general practices for backyard chicken owners. And based on the preferences of the survey participants, we could create resources that could be obtained from the internet as that was their preferred source for information, but additionally having resources available in person from chicken retailers, rental agencies, public health units, feed stores, or veterinarians may increase our range of access in providing that information. And our main objective would be to increase public awareness of diseases transmissible from backyard chickens to humans and of measures that can be taken to reduce the risks of infection. So really focusing on performing hand hygiene after handling chickens or their environment, as well as preventing contact between backyard chickens and immunocompromised individuals. In addition, it would be important as well to highlight the necessity of seeking preventative veterinary care to prevent diseases in backyard chickens.
And I will end with just a few acknowledgements. Uh, we'd like to acknowledge our other co-author, Dr. Scott Weiss, as I mentioned, he's director of public, our uh, Center for Public Health and Zoonoses and a professor at the University of Guelph and the Ontario Veterinary College. Uh, thank you as well to everyone at Public Health Ontario who supported our involvement in the project and the development of the manuscript for publication. We'd also like to acknowledge all of those who took time to respond to the survey, providing valuable information as well as our partner agencies and the local public health units who helped promote the survey. And with that, I will turn it back over to Curtis as Kath and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Devin and Catherine. We will now move on to the Q&A segment of this event and address some of the questions from our audience. Just a quick note to our attendees to please continue to enter, answer, enter your questions into the Q&A pod if you have not already done so. Okay, moving on to question one. Are there common hatcheries selling chickens to both Canada and the US? I can answer that, Devin. So yes, my understanding is that Canada does import some of its chicks from hatcheries in the US, although obviously during the current um, HPAI outbreak, there are restrictions on importing from states that are impacted by avian influenza. But yes, some are domestically produced and others are imported. I'm not sure what the traceback is like for chickens. Like, I don't know if we had um, a case of illness linked to a, someone's backyard chicken that we would ever be able to trace it all the way back to the producing hatchery. But if we did have cases that were linked at a molecular level to the US, we would be able to identify that through whole genome sequencing. Great, thank you. Uh, next question. In your survey, did you ask about backyard flock egg cleaning and handling or about slaughter practices? I can start with uh, this one, and then I think maybe Catherine can probably pop in and provide a bit more information. Uh, we didn't go into uh, detailed questions about uh, these particular practices, although in hindsight, I think that probably would have been really interesting uh, to, to go into a bit more detail. As far as the egg washing, I'll let maybe Catherine provide some, uh, uh, some details on that because that is something that uh, she does have some information on. But uh, yeah, there did not appear to be a lot of guidance available for the process for slaughtering chickens from um, backyards. So I think that is a, certainly an opportunity uh, for some information. Yeah, so like Devin said, we were we were unprepared for the number of people that indicated that they were actually eating their backyard chickens, especially when we knew that they were considering them to be pets. So we didn't actually investigate any of what their actual practices were um, with respect to egg washing or meat preparation or slaughter. Um, but we do know, because this is a question that we get asked, is do our eggs need to be refrigerated, for example? So Although, or do they need to be washed? So washing the egg actually removes the cuticle that's on top of the egg. So if there is fecal contamination, it allows it to enter the inside of the egg through the pores in the shell. Um, so if eggs are fecally contaminated, they should be washed. However, if they are washed, they should then be refrigerated. So while they can be left on the counter and they are left on the counter in some other countries, it's also subject to local uh, food safety laws. So here in Ontario, in a food premise, for example, they are required to be refrigerated. But we didn't ask people how they're actually managing their eggs as it's somewhat personal preference, especially if they're a private household. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is, while there are some very remote risks of backyard chickens, the literature, including a 2022 review, seems to indicate that there are far safer, they are far safer as pets than dogs or cats with a far lower burden of illness, including bites overall and certainly not public health concern. What would be your bottom line assessment as well? If so, why do you think there's such a disproportionate focus on backyard chickens as opposed to more common pets with much greater public health threat? That's a really good question. Maybe I'll start. So our focus was obviously disproportionate in this particular survey because it, where we live, um, licensing for backyard chickens was relatively new. So it was more of an information gathering exercise to see how we could best support backyard chicken owners, not that we're against backyard chickens, just to see how we could provide necessary information to address any identified knowledge gaps. Um, I don't know uh, which 2022 review is being referenced, but I think there is an element of truth to that because cats and dogs, for example, are a natural reservoir for numerous different pathogens that can infect people. I think there's a narrower pathogen range associated with chickens compared to some other domestic pets. And also, although people may um, like snuggle their chickens and kiss them and things like that, the degree to which they have that close contact is likely far lower compared to something that does live within their household. So for example, cats and dogs, people may share their bed with them and have a higher degree of close contact and potential for exposure. So I think both a combination of the level and uh, 
uh, volume of interaction as well as the reservoirs that or the natural range of pathogens associated with each combination of both. What do you, I don't know if Devin yeah. wants to add anything. I think that's just really kind of highlighting it's a good opportunity to look at these types of exposures through a One Health lens and just really kind of, you know, recognizing um, the role animals might be playing, the recognized, you know, backyard chickens, obviously with association with some of those salmonella outbreaks, but yeah, I guess additionally, yeah, the role of pets um, shouldn't be discounted either. So yeah, that's a good comment. All right, next question. Do any municipalities that currently allow backyard chickens have any mandatory training resources that people have to go through before they can register their chickens? Ooh, not that I'm aware question. of. Not that I'm aware of. We did do uh, quite a bit reviewing of what the bylaws are. Um, they vary quite a bit between municipalities, but really focused more on things like uh, you know, the size of a yard and the number of chickens. So flock sizes could vary depending on the municipality. Some didn't actually even indicate limits, but I don't recall coming across anything requiring training. No, me either. And I know where I live, although backyard chickens are permitted under local bylaws, whether or not you choose to register your flock is currently optional. So we don't actually have a way to enumerate them or we have no idea how many there are, where they are, who has them. So I would suspect that no, but it's also relatively new. Like this is seems to be more of an emerging practice, especially during COVID-19. Um, so I think as things evolve, maybe there'll be more attention given to kind of fleshing out the process a little bit. Thank you. Um, among the salmonella cases reporting backyard poultry exposure, do they have the same whole, whole genome sequence strains as those likely linked to retail poultry meat exposure? That is a good question. So to flip it a little bit, normally when we become aware of whole genome sequencing clusters, it's when we have two or more cases that are linked to the same whole genome sequencing cluster within zero to nine alleles within a 60 day period. So it would start with the recognition of a whole genome sequencing cluster, and then we would look to identify common exposures. That being said, if it's a pre-existing cluster code that's been identified and it has been previously associated with say um, retail poultry, as a food commodity, then that would be something that would be noted. So we would be able to see if it was previously linked to food or was that was believed to be the ultimate source. And then we, then we could see what the risk factors were that people reported as a result of their case investigation. But whether we could say that those chickens came from the same flock or same hatchery, I don't know that we would ever be able to make that connection. Hopefully that answers that question. Are long-term, just to confirm, are long-term care homes in Ontario able to host backyard chickens? Are there specific resources to educate the persons who are responsible for the long-term care homes, you know, IPAC? So I believe they, there are no specific restrictions for long-term care homes. I think it kind of varies by the home, whether or not they want to have them. Um, Catherine from her health inspection days might have something to say about that. I'm not aware of any specific resources. Uh, possibly the provider of the chickens might have things. Certainly when we were looking at what was available, it really wasn't focused on uh, things like IPAC. But I think, again, this is, a, this is a really good opportunity for us to kind of focus on that high-risk group. If we do find that that is something that's happening frequently, it would be a great group to target um, for some resources. Yes, yeah, so as Devin mentioned, in my previous professional life, I was a public health inspector. I did used to visit long-term care and retirement homes, and I did encounter flocks at some of these. They were usually acquired on a seasonal basis, so they would be kept outdoors in a coop, and it's a great opportunity for residents um, to interact with the chickens and collect the eggs and, and have those experiences, particularly the, those that came from a farm background. It was a really nice um, thing to be able to offer. But in general, our approach was to ask places, rather than to say, no, don't do it, to say, let us know if this is something you're considering and then we can have an up upfront discussion about some of the considerations um, and IPAC practices that should be in place. So for example, making sure that you have accessible hand hygiene, dedicated clothing or footwear when entering the coop, um, making sure if you're a food premise that you're not serving the eggs that are collected from the chickens and things like that. So just having those opportunities for dialogue upfront rather than after it's been put in in case there's some changes that need to be made. Okay. What measures would you suggest to municipalities to mitigate risk of zoonotic transmission? So an example they have is registry of backyard chicken owners for dissemination of information. 
I think that's a great place to start, um, just being able then to, as Catherine mentioned, just enumerate the number of properties that do have the chickens and generally where they are. And then if you do see increases in cases like Salmonella and Campylobacter, you'll be able to you know, potentially overlay and sort of use that to support your investigation. And I think just having that information available for them, ensuring that people do have access to the proper information and their awareness and recognition of the potential risks and then the mitigation factors that they can implement themselves, um, just so they have that full awareness if they are getting back your chickens, what the potential risks are and what they can do. Devin and I have talked about this extensively. And one of the things that was brought to our attention, which I see um, there's another question related to this, is that as soon as someone apparently tells their small animal or companion veterinarian, which is what most vets are in suburban or urban areas, that they have backyard chickens and that they're using these for their meat or eggs, apparently these are no longer considered companion animals and can't be treated by that vet as they're then considered a commodity species. And it requires a special certification in order to be able to treat them. So one of the things that we would suggest is that um, making registration mandatory or at least having some idea of how to reach these individuals in the event that something happens. So avian influenza being a key situation, it would be nice to be able to reach out proactively to people with information about things to, to be aware of, but also having information on hand about when to contact a veterinarian and a list of veterinarians that are qualified to see these birds so that they have accessible veterinary care in the event that they need it, especially um, birds that may be kept as backyard flocks might live a lot longer than the typical um, bird that's raised for meat. So broilers that are raised for food would be called a lot earlier, whereas backyard chickens will likely, if they're kept long term, live out their natural lifespan. So you'd have um, concerns there about making sure, as Devin said, that your chickens are healthy as well. And just I can follow up a little bit more on the veterinarian um, availability. So yeah, I do think it's really important that to ensure that you do have access to a veterinarian that will care for your chickens in the event your chicken needs urgent care, and also a process as to whether or not you would bring the chicken to a clinic or have a vet that is mobile that can provide a care on site. And I think uh, going through the College of Veterinarians of Ontario, um, their website has a spot where you can search for veterinarians in your area. And I think reaching out to them, they can probably direct you to uh, you know, the closest available um, vet to care for your chickens. That's just a starting point um, if you're looking for care. And similarly, at uh... A producer level, there are vaccines available for poultry that can help prevent salmonella um, at the breeder level. So there are vaccines for salmonella typhimurium and salmonella enteritidis, which are two of the serotypes most commonly associated with poultry, as well as multivalent vaccines. Um, so the strategy aiming to reduce fecal shedding is more effective than culling flocks that are infected. Um, but I'm not sure if those vaccines are actually available for backyard chickens. So that would be something to worth including in resources as well. I did come across a local uh, vet actually close to where Catherine and I live that has uh, days where you can bring your chickens to this clinic and they will provide you with some of the recommended vaccines. So Merrick's disease, for example, is recommended as it causes serious infection uh, caused by a chicken herpes virus. So they, they will provide them if you, um, but just the awareness of that, I'm not sure how broadly that uh, information is known, but there are some clinics um, that will provide the vaccines, but I feel like it was up to the, the owners to distribute those themselves. Thank you. Um, is there a risk or concern to groundwater soil contamination? Well, that is a good mm. question. So we know that there's a seasonal trend with some of our enteric bacterial pathogens, Salmonella and Campylobacter being two of those. So anytime you have a reservoir animal species that naturally carries these bacteria in their gastrointestinal tract and sheds into the environment via their feces, there is obviously the potential through rainfall and whatnot for these to get into the um, saturate into the earth or to run off into rivers or whatnot. So there is that potential. Necessarily, would a small flock have a dramatic impact on that? No, compared to a commercial operation. Um, but it is theoretically something that could happen. Um, if any flu was found in a backyard chickens in an area, would the chickens be called? Could this be enforced on private property as well? That is another good question. I'm not sure what the regulations are. Catherine, are you aware of what they would be on private property for small flocks? No, I'm not sure how that's enforced. That would be through CFIA. I, we do know, though, that if flock owners do have a deceased chicken or one of their flock passes away or they have signs or symptoms compatible, likely the path they would take would be to reach out to a veterinarian, but they are also um, required to report that to CFIA. So the 
um, OMAFRA might find out through the CFIA or Ministry of Health might find out through CFIA. But if you do have backyard chickens and if your birds do suddenly die off or if they have signs and symptoms, we would encourage you to report that. And I think laboratories too are aware that the reporting positive cases need to go to the public health unit in OMAFRA. So there's different pathways and then, but starting there, I think, and that's how you kind of get your support as to what needs to happen. Um, most chickens, ducks, and pheasants are purchased through local feed stores from main poultry suppliers. Any thought on providing information packages to the feed supply stores or source of contact with the flock owners? That I was think one of the be, conclusions. Yeah, yeah, I think that would be a great place to start, really kind of figuring out exactly where everyone's getting these birds from and then targeting those main suppliers. But yes, I absolutely think that would be a great place to, to start providing educational resources that they can distribute. We couldn't go into all of our findings. Um, if anyone is interested, we did publish this work, but we did also ask in our survey where individuals were acquiring their backyard chickens. And the number one was from a local farm and feed store was the second most common. Just over a fifth of our respondents indicated that that was the source. So in our conclusions, that is what we had suggested as well, that if we were to develop any type of educational resource, it would be good to have this available at multiple points, including online, which is obviously where um, folks expressed a preference to obtain information. So just having this readily accessible at as many points as possible. Thank you. I think we just have a few questions left. Um, for the one study, what was the denominator for the salmonella outbreaks in the US study? Exam example, around 200 out of how many total? Unfortunately, they did not provide that information. They just quantified how many um, outbreaks they had that were linked to backyard chickens and then which serotypes were implicated. Will there be any other surveys about the risk of attraction of other wild wildlife like rats, raccoons, foxes, coyotes, etc.? Uh, yeah, that's like backyard chickens. Yeah. I'm assuming right. it's like the risk of those things coming in. Coming in. Um, so that was uh, as part of the information that is provided by the suppliers. Uh, things like that, preventing kind of predators or or other animals from coming in, was one of the uh, commonly addressed issues. It wasn't as much focused on zoonotic um, infection risk, but uh, a lot of those coops are you know advertised as being uh, completely impervious to predators coming in and protecting the chickens. So it was something that was addressed. But again, that is you know especially with the avian influenza moving into some other non-avian species. Species, definitely something, um, yeah, worth exploring. So certainly, Catherine and I have lots of ideas on how to move this uh, work forward that we'd love to pursue. Um, are private properties allowed to cull the chickens for meat on their properties? Yes. So my understanding is that there is an exemption under the Meat Inspection Act that if you are um, raising chickens, for example, for your own personal use on your own personal property and won't be sharing this with anybody or selling it or anything like that, there is an exemption to having this uh, slaughtered at a local processing plant. So our understanding is that I could raise a chicken on my own private property, slaughter that for my own personal consumption. The downside to that being, as Devin mentioned, there are ethical concerns if somebody doesn't have experience with that, um, as well as if it's done by an individual on their own premises rather than in a licensed slaughter plant, there's no opportunity for either anti-mortem or post-mortem inspection, which might theoretically increase the risk of exposure to zoonotic pathogens. Like you can't necessarily see that um, an animal is colonized or infected with the naked eye. But yes, it is possible. Um, are there concerns by neighbors about noise? Guessing noise but that's a good question. So the majority of the uh, municipalities will only allow hens, not roosters. I did come across one that did allow a rooster. So hens are generally considered to be quieter than roosters. Uh, but a lot of people are liking it to, you know, dogs, having dogs in the uh, in your backyard barking. Um, certainly hens do make some noise. I, I think it really depends on the tolerance of your neighbors and maybe how big your yard is. Um, I, I, yeah, I don't think they're they're silent by any means, but um, you know, probably comparable to other animals that might be in backyards. Thank you. So as we're approaching uh, one o'clock, as we wrap up today's PH rounds, I would like to send a special thank you to Catherine and Devin for presenting. And I would also like to thank everyone who joined us for today's webinar. You can expect to receive a brief and anonymous PHO rounds survey today's session. Please try to complete this to help us improve our programming. Lastly, to access past PHO rounds and view confirmed and upcoming sessions, please visit the PHO website, head to education and events, and click on presentations. Thank you and have a wonderful day.